So I'd like to start with our first speaker, uh, Otis Webb Brawley, MD, uh, medical uh, oncologist and epidemiologist. Dr. Brawley is the Bloomberg Distinguished Professor in the School of Medicine and the Bloomberg School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins University. Dr. Brawley is a member of the National Cancer Institute Board of Scientific Advisors from 2007 to 2018 as Chief Medical and Scientific Officer of the American Cancer Society, uh, Dr. Brawley oversaw the largest private sector uh, cancer research funding program in the US. He is the recipient of numerous awards and honors and is the author of many important publications. I'd like to call Dr. Brawley to the podium, please. Thank you, sir. Thank you and good morning. Uh, it is my task to explain what's happening in terms of cancer incidence and mortality and make some projections about uh, cancer incidence and mortality and the burden of cancer in the United States into 2030-2035 realm. Uh, the past very frequently helps us to predict the future. I will give you the Cliff Notes version. Age-adjusted incidence and age-adjusted mortality is expected to continue going down over the next 15 to 20 years. The population, however, will be increasing in size, and the age, uh, the average age of the population will be increasing, and as a result, we anticipate that the number of people who are diagnosed with clinical cancer and the number of people who, are di who die of cancer will actually increase. Absolute numbers will go up, while age-adjusted incidence and mortality rates will go down. That's for clinical cancer. Incidence rates may go up as technologies improve, and we develop uh, uh, blood tests that, uh, that find people having circulating cancer cells, but clinical incidence will go down. Now, the American Cancer Society estimates that approximately 1.8 million Americans will be diagnosed with cancer this year, and 607,000 will die. Uh, Age-adjusted mortality rates have declined by 27% uh, from 1991 to 2016. Uh, this is just showing the incidence rate in men for a number of different cancers. You can see the PSA effect and prostate cancer uh, incidence at the top there. Uh, lung cancer mortality has driven most of the male uh, patterns, but you can see a slight rise in bladder, uh, melanoma, liver, thyroid cancer. This is incidence rate for women from 1975 through 2015, and you can see slight rises in breast cancer, uh, a rise in lung cancer, but a recent decline that started around the turn of the century, dramatic decline in colorectal cancer, Uterine corpus, thyroid, and melanoma are going up as is liver. This is looking at mortality rates from 1930 through 2016. Men in blue on top, women in pink. And you can see the mortality declines that started in the late 1980s, early 1990s, and then all of the various cancers uh, for men and women below. Again, age-adjusted incidence and death rates are projected to continue downward over the next 20 years, but the U.S. population size will increase and is aging. The upwards, uh, uh, the number, absolute number is going up because of changes in population risk, changes in diagnostic practices, population growth, as well as population aging. This slide uh, is very busy and small, but it just shows you going back uh, into the early 1970s, the effect of aging population, population growth, uh, as well as changes in uh, risk factors on the population. The absolute number of cancers diagnosed and treated will increase from about 1.8 million this year to about 2.3 million in 2035. The cancers that are rising in number are listed there for men as well as for women. And very importantly, the number of cancer survivors will also increase. In 2007, there were approximately 11.7 million Americans who were cancer survivors. In 2026, the um, CDC estimates that there will be 20.3 million cancer survivors. Between 
2005 and 2050, the nation's population will increase from 296 million to 438 million. That's an increase of 142 million or 48% increase in population size. Keep in mind that the average age in which someone is diagnosed with cancer is in their 60s and the median age of death is in the early 70s, as you can see here. So cancer is a disease primarily of older people. 14.9% of the U.S. population was over 65 in 2015. 22.1% of the U.S. population will be 65 or over in 2015. Now, transitioning an assessment of cancer disparities by race, by location, and by socioeconomic status. The, I do this because disparities in the United States have increased over the last 30, 35 years, no matter how you define them, and they are going to increase greater uh, uh, in the future. The past does uh, frequently illustrate future patterns. These are using OMB racial definitions. Keep in mind, these are socio-political categorizations of race. Race is not a biological concept. Give you an idea of how race is sociopolitical. Barack Obama was white in the 1970 census and black in the 1980 census. Uh, these are uh, death rates for the sociopolitical categorization of black, white, Native American, Hispanic, and Asian Pacific Islanders. This is looking at breast, prostate, and colorectal cancer. You can see for breast and colorectal cancer, there were no black-white disparities in the 1970s, and all the black-white disparities started happening in the 1980s and beyond. These are death rates. The death rate for blacks and whites are more disparate today in breast and colorectal cancer than they were at any time in our history, and there were no black-white disparities in the 1970s. As we learn how to screen, diagnose, and treat these diseases, there are groups of people who are more likely to get them effectively, and there are groups of people who are less likely to get them. And you'll note the other three uh, racial ethnic groups are, uh, have lower death rates than blacks and whites. Now, in 2019, uh, there were 269,000 uh, or there will be 269,000 women and men diagnosed with breast cancer, and there will be 42,300 deaths. For women, there has been a 40% decline in age-adjusted mortality rate in the United States from 1990 to 2016. 40% decline overall throughout the United States. Now, the dark blue states are the states that have had a 44 to 51 percent decline, and the purple states are the states that have had a 20 to 29 percent decline. Uh, I am, I've switched up. We were talking about racial disparities. We are now talking about Massachusetts versus Mississippi. These disparities are going to grow. In colorectal cancer, 101,400 colon cancers, 44,000 plus rectal cancers, 51,000 deaths this year. There has been a halving of the death rate in age-adjusted colorectal cancer since 1980. An American's risk of dying from colorectal cancer is half today what it was in 1980 overall. The states in blue are the states that have had a 55 to 63 percent decrease in mortality since 1980. And the states in purple are the states that, well, actually, Louisiana and Mississippi have had a 12 percent decrease, while the country as a whole has had a 50 percent decrease. And if you throw out the old Confederacy, the United States is well over a 50 percent decline in mortality. These are the states that have high smoking rates in dark red, uh, and then uh, as a result, high mortality from lung cancer. And the states, uh, California, Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, have very low death rates from lung cancer. Cancers due to tobacco use are declining, more so in men than in women, and they will continue to decline into the future. Energy balance, that is the combination of 
overweight or obesity, too many calories and lack of exercise. Think of it as a three-legged stool, too many calories, lack of exercise, and obesity. It's not just obesity. Uh, that is destined to become the leading cause of cancer in the United States in the very near future, if not now. Uh, Two-thirds of adults and a third of children in the United States today are overweight uh, or obese. Just looking at obesity, 5% of children were obese in 1970, and 20% are obese today. Uh, and so this is becoming an increasing problem. Uh, the group that I used to work with at the American Cancer Society recently published a paper noting that there's an increase in death rate uh, from cancer in, for people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s, while there's an overall decline for the entire population. And that increase in death rate in at least six cancers has been attributed to this triad of too many calories, not enough exercise, and obesity. Then there's liver cancer and oral cancers and cervical cancer and cancers that are caused by infectious diseases. Uh, these are all preventable cancers, by the way. Prevention of cancer is clearly a need in the future, and our workforce will need to adjust and have people who practice cancer prevention and control. Uh, these are all of the uh, known causes of cancer as put together by uh, Graham Colditz a couple of years ago. You can see smoking, overweight, obesity, and diet and exercise uh, come together almost to equal smoking and obesity right now. Um, viruses, alcohol, uh, UV and ionizing radiation. Incidentally, one to one and a half percent of all cancer deaths in the United States is now linked to diagnostic radiation. Radiation, be it from mammography, CT scanners, and other things. What if we applied what we already know? Uh, how can we provide adequate, high-quality health care to include preventive services? Uh, is, uh, I think, one of the most important questions that we can ask in cancer control. We've pointed out that uh, about 600,000 people are dying every year with 607,000 who are going to die this year. Uh, the American Cancer Society noted that uh, people who are college graduates have a much lower risk of death in the United States from cancer than people who are not college graduates. And simply asking the question, what if everybody in the United States had the risk of cancer death of a college graduate? We find that a quarter of all cancer deaths would go away. The cost of the disparities in the United States of people not getting what we actually know everyone should get is at least 150,000 lives a year. A quarter of all deaths would go away. This is not new science. Actually, the new science is getting people all the science we already know. This is not a new drug, a new treatment, or a new screen, or a new prevention. This is just getting people what we already know people ought to get. We would prevent a quarter of all cancer deaths, 150,000. Now, what would that look like going off into 2055? Uh, in blue, the blue dotted lines is what has already ha happened. The rise in death rates from the 1970s, the peak in 1991, and the nearly 27% uh, decline to 2015. And we project in the 2035 another 26% decline. But we could, if we started applying what we already know today, have a 41% decline from current age-adjusted death rates. I'm going to finish by talking about health care, the greatest threat to health in the United States. I've talked about the disparities in the United States, and ironically, we have, from 1980 to 2010 and, 20 and beyond, had the greatest rise in expenditures for health care. Uh, this is the U.S. compared to a number of countries in Western Europe and Canada and Japan. In 2016, we spent $3.3 trillion on health care. That is a lot of money. $3.3 trillion makes American health care the, if it were a country, it would be the fifth largest economy in the world. We spent more on health care than was spent on everything in the United Kingdom and came very close to the economy of Germany. 
These are 2016 numbers. You'll note my source, my favorite medical source, the CIA fact book. <laughs> $3.3 trillion amounts to about $10,000 per person. It was 17.8% of our gross domestic product. That's 17.8 cents out of every dollar spent. The number two country in the world was Switzerland at 12.2% of its gross domestic product. This is just looking at life expectancy on the x-axis and healthcare spending on the y-axis. The red dot is the United States. We spend more, and everybody to the right of that red dot lives longer at a cheaper rate. We don't get value in healthcare. The average family healthcare policy in the United States in 2016 was $18,500. In Switzerland, it was $11,600. They actually have health insurance in Switzerland. Costs are going up. And by the way, there's one slide I could have put in here. It is estimated that sometime between 2035 and 2040, the average cost of a family health care policy in the United States and the median family income in the United States will be the same thing. Translate it, we're going to have health care reform. Uh, final slide. This is cost per capita in the United States from 1960 to 2015, real numbers, and then 2020 and 2023 as estimates. In 2023, uh, the center's uh, CMS estimates that health care will cost $15,000 per man, woman, and child and will be 19.3% of our gross domestic income. Keep in mind, our, our outcomes in cancer are not as good as the outcomes in Western Europe, but our costs, our outcomes in all healthcare parameters are not as good, but our costs are in most instances nearly twice that. And so I will conclude with that. Uh, I just wanna say, uh, I've had a trying time over the last three or four months, and many of you have been very supportive of me. Uh, I want to thank you, especially the people from the National Academy, the staff from the National Academy, especially Cheryl Nass and her gang. Thank you very much. <laughs>